what uh, I intend to do in my slot this afternoon is to make some comments um, on, if you like, the interface of ethics and policy. Comments that may be considered a tad iconoclastic um, for some of you. Um, comments which come out, I suppose, of, of my own experience in that uh, I spent most of my professional life engaged in bioethics one way or another. Uh, over the past 10 years, increasingly focusing on the policy implications of the uh, ethical discussions we have about uh, emerging technologies. Uh, and I, as was said, developed and ran for some time while we had funding uh, a center at uh, IIT in Chicago, uh, looking specifically at nanotechnology questions. And one of the things we did was to host a series of conferences in Washington, D.C., which seems to me the uh, place one has to go to focus conversations if they're going to have policy traction. Uh, so over the last uh, three years, moving on from this, although I still have an association with IIT, seeking to develop a think tank in Washington, uh, which is addressing the long-term strategic implications uh, for policy of emerging technologies. And I'll say a bit more about this later, but in a context which seems to be remarkably barren, given that this nation essentially controls three-quarters of R and global R&D in every emerging technology, its innovation economy and its security are driven uh, by these technologies. And there is, uh, as David Barubi was pointing out at, at a popular level, but there's also at a federal government level a remarkable lack of interest in the implications that these technologies considered as strategic policy issues. So to begin... Four comments. Uh, first, uh, on, on bioeth I call bioethics qua biopolicy. Biopolicy seems to me to be something which has sprung out of bioethics as somewhat um, inappropriately and unhelpfully. Uh, secondly, a comment on the urgency of the timescale proposed um, by the developments in these technologies. Thirdly, comment on the disinterest of the policy community, which I think essentially goes from top to bottom. And fourth, a comment on something somewhat different, which is the significance and importance of corporate engagement in these discussions. So that's, uh, that's the plan. First, on the failure of bioethics, qua biopolicy. Bioethics, of course, emerged. It's a made-up word from a generation and a half ago. Uh, emerged as um, a new term for what used to be called medical ethics, to broaden it out, engage the biosciences, and increasingly tap into the policy agenda seems to me as an exercise in sort of around clinical and personal decision making, bioethics has been reasonably uh, helpful as a way of, of setting ground rules for the discussion. It seems to me its uh, crossover into the policy arena has been um, not simply uh, ineffective, but actually has been dangerous because it's given the impression there is such a thing as bioethics out there which resolves policy questions affecting biotechnology, whereas in fact there certainly isn't. Uh, you might want here to look at the story of the President's Council on Bioethics and the Bush administration. I think in significant regard, it wasn't that different from the significance of end back in, uh, under Bill Clinton. Well, who knows what's going to emerge in the new administration? These are all efforts basically to use bioethics as a bridgehead into the policy community. Functionally, uh, as I've said here in this uh, little um, uh, phrase, expert political utility and policy irrelevance, uh, functionally, these are means whereby politicos co-opt the largely academic ethics community, make it think it's really very important, and ensure it has no impact on development of policy. And I think with very few exceptions, I think that has been a consistent story and will be. And that is the case not simply in the U.S., but in most, if not I think all, not the case certainly in Germany, but in, in most Western jurisdictions, that seems to be a way of summing up what has taken place. Now, I no longer actually paid by an academic institution. I can get away with generalizations of this kind without needing to supply the footnotes, although I think I will in the written version of this paper. Um, essentially, if in Washington language, bioethics has been a public liaison exercise, that being the department of the White House where they invite you along to think you're important uh, when uh, thinking you're important is precisely all the contribution they want from you. And, of course, public liaison has been a feature of, of uh, White Houses of all, uh, all, all political complexions. Um, therefore, it seems to me the notion that bioethics somehow supplies a model for nanoethics, neuroethics, 
whatever you want to fill the blank with, is highly questionable. Which isn't to say that the questions under discussion uh, in fora assembled around these terms are lacking in consequence precisely because of their consequence. I think there is something naive and dangerous about assuming that, well, bioethics did a great job for biotechnology, let's repeat this for nano and neuro. I think there are so many questions raised about the integrity of that kind of thinking that that kind of thinking should perhaps be dispatched. Secondly, a comment about the urgency of the emerging technologies timetable now, of course, as with much of what all of us say <laughs> at events like this in summary form, um, this is something of a truism. But in an academic institution where things are being done thoroughly and well, and I do applaud what's going on here because it's happening hardly anywhere else. It's happening here, happening at ASU, one or two other places. Um, the academic timescale, the timescale, of course, of the research processes of the NSF and other grant awarding bodies, um, are fundamentally out of kilter with the uh, exponential changes taking place within these technologies in which basically Moore's law serves as a fairly good rule of thumb for pretty much anything and everything. We have uh, rapidly compounding technological developments, each of them freighted with highly significant social, ethical, broader policy implications. And if you like, uh, one could adopt a kind of Malthusian argument, I suppose, and say that the, um, there's a sort of uh, arithmetic progression in the development of funding for opportunities of this kind. There's a geometric progression in the development of the problems which it is sought to address. These are no small matters, as we know. The fundamental shifts in human society and experience are under discussion. Uh, wherever we end up in the... Uh, set of assumptions that everyone needs to make here about uh, uh, the speed of progress, the speed of change, and it's, you know, it's very unclear. You have, if you like, my rule of thumb is that you go and ask Ray Kurzweil if you want you know, <laughs> to know what one of the bookends is in many of these conversations, to so go to his conferences, which I find fascinating events. Uh, they are, of course, sort of rallies for the, the techno-utopians, uh, but some extraordinarily clever people are involved and take the conclusion that things are incredibly rapid and will be of the kind of beneficent effect that I think many of us question. But as one of the bookends, if you like, in the assessment of the speed of change um, is, is of exceedingly fast change. Uh, others are somewhat more skeptical and think that, you know, whatever the claims of the NCI, that NANSA basic cancer would no longer be a, a, a painful or, or terminal condition um, by 2015, um, haven't sort of pulled out our pocketbooks and written in the date, you know, so that if you can keep yourself cancer-free until then, you've made it. Um, it seems to me that whatever estimate you take of the speed of, of change, um, the, the, the speed is compounding. And the implications of these changes, as of course we, we had elegantly expressed, uh, expressed last night, uh, is, is really quite profound. And one doesn't have to buy into a kind of transhumanist Kurzweilian worldview to expect uh, extraordinary shifts in the fundamental um, assumptions we make about the nature of the human condition and of human society, and expecting these shifts to take place very much within our lifetimes, or at least the lifetimes of those of us who... Uh, um, <laughs> who are going to be around in the next 20 years, uh, with or without uh, magical cures from the NCI. Um, alongside that, of course, we have these extraordinary um, boundary questions, and I, I appreciated the pre pre previous presentation and some of the problems in an institution. How do you give credit, you know, physics credit to a course uh, which doesn't have physics prerequisites? I mean, that's a sort of question which really Washington should be addressing. Uh, let's say the other Washington, uh, the Washington that thinks it counts, um, and, and that decides so many things. And in many ways, much of the development, of course, in these technologies has been on the wrong coast. And uh, the wrongness of the coast on which they have been on is determined primarily by the fundamentally geographical nature of the operation of the policy community in Washington, D.C., which I think is a problem that many people on the West Coast have little awareness of including some of the, the major corporations uh, which have been so influential in developing innovation and which are located on this coast. Um, 
But once you start crossing disciplinary boundaries, once you start breaking out departments, and of course, once you get into the sort of transformational uh, um, mode, which is, uh, you know, uh, much trumpeted uh, in RFPs and things like that, but then not much funded at the end of the day because of the systems in place, I think you begin to see that it's very hard, and the futurists are here finding themselves with far bigger problems than they had um, 30 years ago in seeking to make predictions, uh, simply because of the uncertainties built in to transformational and, and uh, converging uh, technology questions. Comment on the disinterest of the policy community. I think it is very hard to speak about this in sufficiently um, exagger in, in exaggerated language um, or, or in language which is, uh, which is, which is uh, sufficiently grave. In fact, I happened to meet a week or two ago with a very distinguished um, figure in Washington whose name will be known by probably all of you and who is not a partisan animal at all. In fact, he's done various jobs for various administrations, an almost a distinguished man talking about these questions, and he was just shaking his head and saying, you know, well, the federal government really does not have interest in policy in these matters. It's a federal uh, strategic emotion technologist policy is a federal Cinderella. Why is it that the, the, that the, House, uh, the House of Representatives Science Committee is among those junior committees on Capitol Hill? Here in the nation which basically governs these technologies and depends wholly upon them. Um, of course, um, a good... Uh, a good taste for irony is essential if you're going to work in Washington. Uh, but you can't simply hide behind it. Um, there, there, there is tragedy rolled into the disinterest. Um, partly because, of course, of a lack of voter interest. Again, I mean, you know, Barubi made this comment that less than 10% of people seem to be interested in technology policy. And then it tends to be for a kind of rather random reason when they say they are interested. And I think you could probably say the same is true of for members of Congress and the same is true of typical um, appointees in administrations of both complexions. And from my experience, um, the, the same can certainly be true of people who work for the OSTP, which seems, I assume you all know what OSTP is, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, where it seems to me not a great deal of science technology policy is done. There's some good people there in the current uh, situation, and I have high hopes of them. Um, but it will be very interesting to see whether they take a lead. One of the problems, of course, is, is the, the silo structure of, the, of, of, of federal government. Um, because these issues aren't, really aren't issues for science and technology policy. They're issues for labor policy, for employment, for housing policy, for education policy, for security policy. Uh, and and the, the fact that interagency activities in the federal government are among the biggest problems um, augurs very badly for the rapidity of change and the profundity of change um, coming, out of the, coming off the anvil of, of technology development. Um, in parallel with this, of course, corresponding to it some perhaps a partial cause, a partial effect, is the fundamental lack of interest on the part of the major think tanks in these questions. And you can go on all the major think tanks, and they have little or no, and in some cases, no interest in this conversation. And they will tell you, they've certainly told me, What's more, you also have little engagement between the policy community and investors. And I'm going to come on to this in a minute. Um, and I think partly the reason for much of this is that there is a shallow and increasingly um, credulous assumption of fundamentally incremental change in the impact of technology on the wider society. I'll give you one little example. I, um, I mentioned, I mean, I went to Kurt Swile's conference a few months ago. Any of you there, that, that down in San Mateo or whatever it was? I mean, really, these, these, are, these are fun events. He's having one in New York City in a few weeks' time. Um, but one, one, of, one of the speakers um, was a computer expert who's quite well-known and has made a lot of money out of a website he's developed. Um, he uh, was talking about the future of robotics for employment policy. And he wasn't a sort of Kurzweil true believer, at least that wasn't coming across. He was hissed and booed by some of the audience as a result. Um, and uh, he simply said he reckoned in 10 years' time we'd probably have humanoid robots. You know, the Japanese, of course, working enormously on the humanoid uh, side of, of, of robotics, which would essentially pick off 50% of the jobs in the U.S. economy. I mean, part of the brilliance of Walmart and fast food and so on is precisely that people with limited competency can do well very simple, broken-down jobs. I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is one of the things that's driven the, that driven the U.S. economy. And he said half these jobs will be able to be taken by humanoid robots. Now, 10 years, who knows whether he's right. The Japanese have spoken in rather shorter-term expectations. Maybe it's going to be 20 years. 
Maybe they'll find it costs a buck an hour more than the minimum wage to employ the robot, so it won't work that way. But when you have questions of this kind, and you talk to, as I did a little while ago, a highly placed political appointee in the Department of Labor in the previous administration, asking her who was working on her team on these issues, who was lying awake at night, lest half the employment in the economy go to Japanese machines, I think she looked at me as if I was a Japanese machine. I mean, this, the conversation was over, and she said, I'm quite sure nobody is looking at these things, and I don't see why they're significant. Uh, so, I mean, those of us who could come and go to Washington and others, others will be in the same position. We, we have, I mean, the kind of anecdotes one picks up are um, um, well enough to drive one to drink or beyond. Assumptions are merely incremental change. And, of course, when we have a two-year electoral cycle, this does not help if your name is Saddam Hussein or Ceausescu. You do think of the next generation. And, of course, they did, in the end, wrongly. Uh, the Kims in North Korea seem to be carrying on thinking in the next generational terms. Um, if you have a two-year electoral cycle, it's very difficult to think in terms of two and a half years. And this has profound implications for the nature of our democracy and its ability to address perhaps the most profound questions it's ever been called to address. Fourthly, um, Plea for corporate engagement in these discussions. I don't know, I looked through the list, in fact. I don't know if there's anybody here who's here primarily on behalf of, of, of a corporation, um, technology corporation. Uh, they'll want people with connections with them. Uh, obviously, this isn't meant to be that kind of conference, but what kind of conferences do we need to have? Uh, the various ways you can look at this, of course. Um, one is um, simply in terms of finding a way into the policy discussion that has more traction than the word ethics will bring with it or the word academy will bring with it, two of the weakest words in the political lexicon. Um, another is a recognition that investment decisions may in fact have a profounder impact on the culture than policy decisions as technologies uh, come on stream, which are going to transform the possibilities of human existence. Um, recognition um, that a wholly different structured conversation will be necessary to bear the weight of the questions being raised by these technology developments. Various ways one can, one can lay it out. Um, but I, I will uh, come, to a, come to a stop and uh, give us a little time for, for, for discussion, making simply this comment that I, um, I think one doesn't have to you know, be a, be a, a techno-utopian or uh, you know, commit oneself to a particular... Um, timetable and development of these, t of, of, of these technologies uh, on the nanoscale primarily, which is, of course, the thrust, the thrust of, the, of, this, of this discussion, uh, to take the view that a um, whole sort of different kind of society is being given birth to by these technology developments. The fact that, by and large, so far, they have been almost in the way of business toys and personal toys, focusing on the implications of taking 19th century technologies, basically the telephone, uh, pulling it off the wall, and the typewriter, and giving it intelligence of a kind, uh, and, and playing with, 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 the, with these two. With, with these two. Um, that so far, there's been a harmlessness, uh, even if a combination of utility and annoyance in the rolling out of these technologies. Now we're talking about bionic eyes. Now we're talking, of course, about the exploitation of the brain-machine interface for purposes, of course, of, of therapeutics, but, of course, also purposes of, of gaming and, finally, purposes of information and, 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 and communication. Um, we're beginning to ramp up into a fundamentally different kind of set of possibilities for the human community. And one doesn't have to take the view these things are all going to be terrible or the things, things are all going to be wonderful. One should, I hope, simply take the view these things are all going to be enormously consequent in the way in which they affect the possibilities for our human society. And among those possibilities will be the possibilities that ought properly to be shaped by public policy, uh, both, of course, domestic policy and also increasingly by global policy as through agencies, of course, like parts of the UN system, the functional parts of the UN system, like OECD, um, we're going to have to find global ways of setting the fundamental parameters um, for the impact of these technologies upon the human community. So it seems to me that um, we need to retool uh, and engage in a somewhat different kind of conversation. And essentially, we need to ramp up the significance of technology policy within the policy community, particularly the federal policy community, if we're going to have an opportunity 
to give some kind of freighting and significance to the concerns which professionally each of us is addressing. Thank you very much.